This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And we're on the road in Venice, Italy, the site of the Venice Biennale, the oldest and most prestigious international biennial art exhibition in the world. The theme of this year is all the world's futures. You may hear inside where we're broadcasting outside today at the Arsenale uh, in the midst of Venice, people singing. Well, uh, we're beginning today with one of the most celebrated Palestinian artists, Emily Jasser. In 2007, she won the Golden Lion here at the Venice Biennale for her work, Material for a Film. It was a large-scale installation based on the life of Palestinian writer Wael Zwatter, who was assassinated near his home in Rome, Italy, by Israeli Mossad agents in 1972. For years, Emily has created groundbreaking art to capture the Palestinian experience experience and other issues. In 2001, she presented uh, titled Memorial to 418 Palestinian Villages Destroyed, Depopulated and Occupied by Israel in 1948. The piece consisted of a large refugee tent with the names of 418 Palestinian villages embroidered on it. She later did a project called Ex Libris that commemorated the approximately 30,000 books from Palestinian homes, libraries and institutions. Um, that were looted by Israeli authorities in 1948. Emily Jasser is speaking here at the Creative Times Summit as part of the Venice Biennale, and we welcome you to Democracy Now! Thank you. I am so excited to be here. I just have to say this because my father is probably your biggest fan. Well, thank God for fathers. <laughs> Uh, so, Emily, you gave a remarkable speech here yesterday, what, where you, as well, a person not from Venice, though you lived in Rome, mm -hmm. gave us a tour of Venice, a kind of geopolitical, cultural tour that most people are not privileged to get. Talk about what many visitors may miss. Yesterday, I spoke about a project I made for the 2009 biennial called Stazione, which was a public intervention that was meant to take place on the 25 Vaporetto stops, the Vaporetto being the water bus line, the water bus stops, um, that runs through the heart of Venice. And what I did was I translated each of the names into Arabic and placed the Arabic names next to the Italian, creating a bilingual transportation route into the city. Um, and what inspired this project was a two-year period of researching the history of Venice when it was really interdependent with the rest of the Mediterranean and I was interested in exploring the heritage, the shared heritage Venice shares with the Arab world. So, for example, the very first book ever printed, mechanically printed in Arabic, was called The Book of Hours. And it was printed here in Venice, I think it's 1514, by Gregorio di Gregori. Um, another uh, highlight from that research was the first mechanically printed Quran in the world was printed here in Venice by Alessandro and Paganino Paganini in 1537. And the glass blowing technique that Venice is so famous for was actually developed in Palestine. The Murano. The glass, glass. blowing technique, the, the technique of glass blowing. Because this was a, from a period where there was all this exchange, the border, there was no borders. It was a, it was, Venice was like a liquid city. Uh, so it's a, it's a shared heritage, all of this. Um, there are words in um, the Venetian dialect that are that come from Arabic. For example, where the summit is being held, the Arsenale, it comes from the Arabic word Dar Sana, which means house of manufacture. So it's really, really, really an incredibly rich and layered history. Um, the architecture, if you take Vaporetto Line 1, you will see... And explain what the Vaporetto is. The Vaporetto is the water bus that you take to move around the city. It's the bus. It's like a bus in any city, but it's the water For bus. For all folks <laughs> to understand, Venice is a remarkable city of canals. There are no cars, so you either take gondolas or you take these Vaporettos, which we have been on throughout <laughs> Venice. It's kind of like a... Well, a uh, watery subway system, you could say. It's exactly. Yeah. Small ferries, 
right. And yeah. each station stop has uh, the Italian name of the stop, like exactly. uh, what Santa Elena. Or... Yeah, exactly. Or Biennale, Arsenale, San Marco, um, and the the stops are actually these separate floating kind of pla not fl platforms jutting out into the water. So the idea also of putting the Arabic next to the Italian so w was so that the stops would have a dialogue with the architecture along the Grand Canal, which is this incredible mixture of influences from the Arab world and here. So you did this for the 2009. Uh, Biennale in 2009. 2009. Yeah. You were going to do this project. You were actually going to put the Arabic name translations yeah. of the Italian stops on each stop. Yeah, we worked with the Vaporetto company that's in charge of the, all the lines and the bus stops. And they were really excited about the project. And they were going to fund the project, actually. And um, they had asked me to create a text to explain to tourists, to put on some of the stops, why, what, what is this Arabic that is on these stations. And we were going to have an opening with the mayor of Venice. But then shortly before the Biennale, the project was shut down. By? The city officials. Somebody came to the head of the Vaporetto company and told them that this was not to take place in Venice. Which was really devastating for me because it, I think it's a very important project dealing with a beautiful history, a shared history, a shared cultural heritage. Um, and it was a secular project, which is also something that's very important. Uh, what did they tell you? So instead you showed it in... Now, at that time, there isn't today, yeah. but you showed it in the Palestinian pavilion. pavilion. It was the first Palestinian pavilion. So what I did instead is I created, when after this happened, I had to come up with something else. I created a brochure, um, which was a map of the project and where biennial goers or whoever could follow this map and go see my project. And when they arrived, they would discover it wasn't there, with my intention being that maybe sometime in the future people would think it was there because I've created this brochure that it actually happened when it didn't. It was the only way to overcome this. Yet yeah, you had won the actual, what is it called? The, the Golden Lion. The Golden gold, Lion the, the year lines. before. Yeah, the, in the 2007 Biennale, yeah. For? For my work called Material for a Film. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But okay. on this issue of not being able to put up these signs, yes. we've reported over the last few days that the Icelandic pavilion yeah. was shut down. Um, when they, uh, the artist, <clears throat> the pavilion was in an old church, hadn't been used by the Catholic Church, I think it's something like 40 years, yeah. turned it into a mosque. And the Venetian authorities said no. Yeah. And in 2005, there was an artist called Gregor Schneider who had, um, was going to put a black cube in Piazza San Marco, and that also got shut down. And explain the Piazza San Marco. Piazza San Marco is the main square of Venice where the church is. Um, it's beautiful. And what was that black square it was to a, represent? It was a, well, that the artist would have to explain. I'm not going to speak on his behalf. But that was shut down because they were scared that it would look too much like Mecca. <laughs> now. The place we're sitting right yeah. now, and some people might hear um, sounds of music or speakers wafting through, uh, we're right next to the theater where the Creative Time Summit is taking place. Um, and we're in an area called the Arsenale. Yes, you got it, the Arsenal. So an old arsenal has, an old arsenal has been changed into an artist space here in Venice. But talk about the Arsenale, or the significance of this area, Emily. Well, it's interesting because it's one of the things that I was just talking about with the translation, because it was the place where shipbuilding took place and where this word Dar es comes from, which is house of manufacture. In Arabic? Yes. <laughs> And it was one of the first industrial assembly exactly. lines where they made warships, yeah. a warship in a day yeah. here in Venice, Italy. We're talking with Emily Josser, who is a Palestinian artist and filmmaker, professor at the International Academy of Art Palestine in Ramallah. Her work includes a diverse range of media and strategies, including film, photography, social interventions, installation and performance, video, writing, and sound. So now I want to go back to 2007, to the yeah. what you won the Golden Lion Award for at the 52nd uh, Venice Biennale.
finale. Um, in 2008, uh, winning uh, the Hugo Boss Prize at the Guggen Muse Guggenheim, Guggenheim Museum for the same thing. Explain what your what your project was. Essentially, that project was about the first Palestinian named Wael Zaiter, who was killed by the Israeli Mossad on European soil in 1972. Um, the title uh, for that project comes from the chapter of a book written by Janet Van Brown, who, who was his companion for eight years. Um, there was a chapter called Material for a Film, where um, Elio Petri, the famous Italian filmmaker, and Ugo Piro had done a series of interviews with the people who knew Wael. Wael was very important in the cultural scene in Italy. Um, he was the first person to bring Alberto Moravia to the Middle East. He took him to Iraq and Syria, Kuwait, and uh, he was very involved with people like Pasolini. So this chapter inspired— And Pasolini was? The Italian filmmaker, Pasolini. So this chapter, uh, basically, I felt that I was building on their work and— um, gathering more material for a film. So the, what the installation ends up being is not only about Wael, but also about my journey in finding him and the traces he left behind. Well, talk about how you found him. You lived in Rome for many yeah, years. Yes. This is where yeah. he was murdered. Yes. Yeah. Um, I lived in Rome for many years, so there was always the specter of his death in my mind since I was a child, of this kind of impending threat. Um, and. Bef to make that project, it actually required that I did a lot of research. It took five years and collaborated mainly with Janet Van Brown, who, as I said before, was his companion. And frankly, we wouldn't really have any information on him or his life if it wasn't for her, because she kept every single document, every single letter, all of his books, she held on to them. So a lot of the work was, was working with her in her apartment, going through her archives to create this piece. She was an Australian painter living in Rome. And talk about the images you used here at the Biennale, which means the Biennial. Again, it's 120 years old, the oldest in the world. And also um, at the Guggenheim. It was, I remember being there, uh, seeing this just breathtaking display. Thank you. Um, what I intended to do was I wanted it to function like you were walking through a film about this man and his life and my life, except unlike a film where if you're watching a film you're in a very passive position and almost being lectured to, you were moving among the elements at your own pace. So there was video and there were sound, various texts, images I had collected from his life, photographs. It, was in, it took place in several rooms, kind of like a maze. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Guggenheim is yeah. the circular building that yeah. you walk up. Um, the response to this, and how did you know that the Mossad assassinated him, the Israeli intelligence? Actually, there was a court case. Uh, it went to the court case in Italy, and uh, it was proven. And uh, their names are actually, which I don't have off the top of my head right now, are available in the documents of that court case. And finishing this project, what did it mean to you, bringing out this man's life and death in such an establishment art institution? And it goes to a bigger question about your role as an artist, also as a Palestinian artist, what you're trying to do. Um, that's a huge question. <laughs> you know, a lot of people might be experiencing or looking at what's going on in the world today, mm -hmm. uh, so many conflicts from Ferguson to Palestine. Um, here we are in Venice at an art exhibition, yeah. and here you are. Um, how does that mesh? How did you choose art as a way of expressing yourself? Well, and do you consider yourself an activist? I do consider myself an activist, but I do also feel that when I'm working with my projects, many of them are very long-term and require a lot of research. And actually, it's kind of the opposite of what journalism is about, because it's about going really slow and taking your time looking at tiny details that may, would not actually normally appear in news reports or news stories or all these, especially all these stories coming out, the way the West Bank and Gaza and Palestine is contextualized in the 
media. Let's go to your third project oh. um, uh, that I wanted to talk about, the tent. Oh, the memorial to 418 villages, yes. Okay. Destroyed, depopulated, and occupied by Israel in 1948. Explain what you did. I was in New York at the time, and I got a family-sized refugee tent. It's really a, it was a community-based project which, which took place over th a three-month period. And I stenciled the names of every village that was destroyed or depopulated or occupied in 1948 onto this tent, and then invited people to come sew with me. Um, sew each name, embroider each name into this tent. and. Um, and where did you get the names of the villages? The villages' names, I used Walid Khalidi's book, All That Remains, which is, and we actually, when we would work on the tent, when someone would start sewing a new village, we would actually read in the book the, the, what he wrote about that village, how, who lived there before, how it was depopulated, etc. And Walid is the father of the Columbia yes, University yeah. professor, Rashid Khalidi. Yeah. And so you had these names. Yes. And it became, it really became, it really became a social space where people came to gather and sew and work. But the other thing that was happening at that time when we were working on that piece was the second intifada had started. So for many of the community, they were on Skype or trying to call family members. Um, you would get on a subway train in the morning and there would be these head, horrible headlines and you just didn't feel safe. So even though we were sewing these names from what happened in 48, we were also gathering in a space where we could be together to deal with what was happening in the contemporary moment. And that and was you really important. left space in the front? I left the space in the front um, because I think the destruction of Palestine is a work in progress that's still going on. So to imply that I would be adding more names later. So there's one panel that's completely empty. Mm. And then there's Ex Libris. Yes. And explain where the installation of Ex Libris was shown. Ex Libris was made for Documenta 13. Documenta 13 is a big art exhibition that happens every five years in Kassel, in Germany. Um, which is an incredible site because it's in the region of Hesse, which is where the biggest book repatriation project in history ever took place when it was under the American zone. And I was very fascinated by this idea of repatriation and restitution of property. So it made sense to me that my project would be about the books which are currently in the Israeli National Library uh, that were looted from Palestinian homes and institutions in 1948. Explain. So I went to the library. Well, first of all, those books are in the Jewish National Library in Hebrew University, and they have um, a mark. AP, that's their catalog number, AP, which stands for Abandoned Property. So it's really interesting because they're part of the system, but they're also, they're, what happened to them is signified in this AP designation. Abandoned property. property. But they were looted, and I went to the library. What do you mean by looted? They were taken from people's homes and institutions and libraries. They were looted. They were stolen. Does the Israeli government recognize this? No. Well, it's in the library. It's in the library under AP. Abandoned property. property. Yeah. So I went and I took photographs of the traces of the original owners, which I found in the books. So that's what the installation is comprised of. Notes, um, flowers, an inscription, somebody's prayer card. What, for example, what would the prayer card look like? Well, there was one that was um, a picture of Jesus, like a, like a little bookmark, you know, these little... Yeah. So a picture of Jesus yeah. in an Arabic book. Yes. Yeah. There, I found, and then I found a note of, or pressed flowers. There were, yeah. And talk about the response to this project. This was really. Um, oh, there was another element of the project actually I forgot to mention, which is that I took some of these inscriptions, and I because I wanted this idea of the public and a collective to be an important part of this. And you know when you write an inscription in a book, it's so small and it's so personal. So I took a couple of them and I turned them into large-scale murals so they would be out in public space. One of them is actually, uh, I put a few years later up in New York, and I think it's still up. You can see it from the High Line. And explain what the High Line um, 
not really a banner. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a painted mural on the wall above mural. my gallery. And what does it say? It's, oh God, I have to remember which one that was. Um, about owning a book? Yeah, it was, uh, this book belongs to its owner, Fathallah Saad, and he bought it with his own money in March 1892, I think it is. And that was the inscription. That was, kind he of wrote it in, in the book, yeah. So I translated it into English, and then we have it in English and Arabic. There and it's remained there It's for still there. I think years. it's still there. <laughs> for those who walk the high yeah, line. For those Your who next project, Emily, as we wrap up. Um, I'm doing a couple of projects one right now. One, two are films that will be uh, filmed here in Italy and a set of drawings. And again, back to the subject of translation and naming. Um, and what gets lost in a translation or gained in a translation, and who gets to name things. Well, I want to thank you very much thank for being you. with us. Emily Jasser is a Palestinian artist and filmmaker, professor at the International Academy of Art Palestine in Ramallah. Her work includes a diverse range of media strategies, including film, photography, installation, performance, video. In 2007, she won the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale here. And in 2008, she won the Hugo Boss Prize at the Guggenheim Museum. We will continue to follow her work over the years. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Mariam Ghani joins us. She's a Brooklyn, New York artist from Afghanistan. She takes on in her art everything from Ferguson to brutality in U.S.-run prisons from Guantanamo to Afghanistan, her own country. She's the daughter of the current Afghanistan president, Ashraf Ghani. Stay with us.